From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Dermatology Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Dermatology. Hello, and welcome to this author interview from the JAMA Network. This is Dr. John Barbieri, Associate Editor for JAMA Dermatology. The incidence of melanoma in situ is increasing more rapidly than any invasive or in situ skin cancer in the United States. Though over half of melanomas diagnosed are MIS, or melanoma in situ, little is known about long-term prognosis following a diagnosis of MIS. In a new study in JAMA Dermatology, using a population-based cohort study of over 137,000 patients with MIS, authors evaluate mortality and factors influencing this mortality after a diagnosis of MIS. Dr. Ade Adamson is an assistant professor in the Division of Dermatology at Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the corresponding author of this new study, and he is joined today by Mr. Vishal Patel, a rising fourth-year medical student at Dell Medical School. They are both here to discuss this work and its potential implications. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Adamson and Mr. Patel. Thanks for uh, having us. It feels odd being on this side of the interview. Yeah, we've done this the other way several times, so now the tables are turned. All right, go, I want you to go easy on me. All right, I'll try to. Well, let me give you an easy one to start with. Dr. Adamson, you know, now that you're on this other side, why don't you tell us a little bit about your role at UT Austin? I am a clinician scientist. Uh, I spend about 80% of my time on research, and I have a day of clinic per week, which is mostly dealing with seeing patients that are either at high risk of melanoma, have had melanoma uh, in the past, and I uh, take care of those patients. And I also see some patients that have general dermatologic concerns as well. And my research focus is involved in looking at patterns of healthcare, particularly as they relate to skin cancer and melanoma specifically. So not only do I look at undertreatment and health disparities related to, to skin cancer, but I also look at overtreatment, overdiagnosis, and those other kinds of topics in melanoma. And Vishal, can you tell us a bit about how you got involved in this work with Dr. Adamson? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I just wanted to thank you for this opportunity to talk about our work and having me as one of the speakers. I'm interested in surgical oncology and you know, throughout my medical school rotations, I've gotten some exposure to patients with melanoma. But really, after talking to Dr. Adamson and figuring out that melanoma in situ represents over half of all melanomas today, I started to piece together just how commonly people are diagnosed with MIS. And when I found out that there isn't really uh, definitive information on prognosis for these patients who are told that they have cancer, uh, it made the importance of pursuing this work really clear. Yeah, it sounds like there is an evidence gap about long-term outcomes for patients with melanoma in situ. Dr. Adamson, do you have anything to add about what led you to specifically study this topic? So I've always been fascinated by the rise in melanoma over the last 40 years, which has been dubbed an epidemic. Right? This has been a six-fold increase in the amount of melanoma that's been diagnosed in the United States. And my research has been involved in trying to figure out why is this the case. And then if you split out Melanoma by stage, right? Stage zero, which is melanoma in situ, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Much of that increase is in stage one and stage zero cancers or MIS or melanoma in situ. And so a lot of patients end up being diagnosed with melanoma in situ, but there was just very little information on exactly what that actually means for their overall survival for their survival compared to the general population. And so we decided to do this research in order to kind of fill in that gap. And I think it's an important gap because there are just a lot of people that are diagnosed with this disorder. Yeah, with you know how common a diagnosis this is becoming, I think trying to understand outcomes for these patients is really valuable information. So when we're seeing people in the clinic, we can tell them what to expect. And as researchers, we can try to understand what's going on with this common condition. In the study, you looked at both relative survival, melanoma, specific mortality, and all-cause mortality. 
Can you tell us a bit about those different outcomes and how they're important and what we can kind of interpret from these different outcomes that you looked at? Yeah, so there are many different ways of measuring how severe, how lethal a disease is. The two big broad ways that you've mentioned are mortality and survival. So mortality is a measure of the total number of deaths in a population, um, and it can be measured as deaths caused by a specific disease, so melanoma-specific mortality, or just as mortality for any reason, all-cause mortality. Then survival is a second big way to measure lethality, and it's a measure of the proportion of people who survive a disease after a specific period of time. And in this study, we actually looked at two different types of survival. So we looked at melanoma-specific survival and relative survival. So melanoma-specific survival is sort of the most common and familiar type of survival statistic that is reported. And this is the proportion of individuals who have died from melanoma during a specific period of time. So for example, if 100 people were diagnosed with melanoma and 80 of them survived, but 20 of them died specifically from melanoma, let's say during a period of 10 years, then you could say the 10-year melanoma-specific survival is 80%. Then relative survival is a related measure. And while in many cases it's numerically similar to disease-specific measures, relative survival incorporates other characteristics beyond just the cancer disease that may distinguish these patients. So If patients with a particular cancer tend to engage in lifestyle or health behaviors that actually impair survival, such as smoking, then their relative survival will be lower. The opposite is also true in that patients with certain cancers may have a higher relative survival. If the cancer is detected incidentally or through screening or because patients who receive preventative care may also engage in healthy behaviors. The way that we calculate relative survival is by comparing the observed disease-specific survival of individuals to the expected survival of similar individuals in the general population, similar meaning of the same age, sex, and race in this case. And ultimately, all these different measures give slightly different insights into the severity of a disease and how it impacts individuals and populations. So another way to put this into context for some of the listeners is that relative survival is essentially what is the survival of people that are the same age, sex, and race that don't have melanoma in sight or some kind of cancer versus those that do. And that can offer some comparative information to patients to sort of understand the specific potential lethality of receiving said cancer diagnosis. It sounds like the relative survival gives us some sense of both the characteristics of the disease and the characteristics of the individuals who have it, whereas the disease-specific survival is really looking at specifically survival related to that disease, in this case, melanoma in situ. Now that we've kind of gone over some of the key outcomes in the study, Can you share with us the main findings of this work? Yeah, so we identified about 130,000 individuals with a first and only melanoma in situ. And of these patients, the 15-year melanoma-specific survival was 98.4%. This means that approximately 1.6% of patients died from melanoma 15 years after their initial diagnosis. The 15-year relative survival was 112%. The fact that this number is greater than 100% means that patients with melanoma in situ lived longer than similar individuals in the general population up to 15 years after diagnosis. So those are our findings in relation to survival. We also found a similar result when looking at mortality. Specifically, we looked at the standardized mortality ratios for melanoma-specific mortality and found that it was about 1.9. 
This means that patients with melanoma in situ were 1.9 times more likely than individuals without the disease to die of melanoma. On the other hand, the standardized mortality ratio for all-cause mortality was about 0.7. And since this number is less than 1, it means that people with melanoma in situ were less likely to die of any reason than individuals in the general population. Those are some really interesting findings. Was there anything in particular that surprised you about what you found? And as clinicians and dermatologists, how does this influence how we counsel our patients or how we think about melanoma in situ? I was somewhat surprised that the relative survival was so much higher in patients that were diagnosed with melanoma in situ. I think conventionally, most people would think that if you're diagnosed with a cancer, that means that you might have a lower likelihood of surviving over a long period of time. And in this case, it appeared almost as though receiving a diagnosis of melanoma in situ was somehow protective of your overall health. And to be clear, it's not that melanoma itself is helping people. We're not saying go out and do tanning boosts to get melanoma. It's probably something else that's contributing to this survival difference. Is that correct? Oh, that's certainly the case. I w- certainly wouldn't, as a dermatologist, advocate for people to go out there and get, uh, get sunburned or, or wish melanoma upon themselves. But it is at least perhaps comforting to patients to know that receiving a diagnosis of melanoma in situ pertains, even for disease-specific survival, really good survival statistics. As Vishal said, you know, 1.6% of folks dying from melanoma at 15 years is, you know, really close to 100%. And the relative survival indicates that you know, perhaps there is something else about a patient receiving that diagnosis, perhaps health-seeking behavior, as an example, because often melanoma in situ is diagnosed through screening or people coming to the doctor. And so that may say something about that person in general. So that may allay the fears of some patients that receive the diagnosis, which sometimes can be devastating. And I see this often in the pigmented lesion clinic that I direct at UT Austin. Do the findings of this work have implications for how we think about both screening asymptomatic individuals in the population and also follow-up screening for those who have a diagnosis of MIS? I think they do. And if you look at another part of our study, which I think drives us home a bit more, we actually wanted to also examine what is the likelihood after receiving a diagnosis of melanoma in situ, do you get a second melanoma? either invasive or another melanoma in situ. And what does that do to some of your survival statistics? Vishal, you mind telling the audience a bit more about those analyses and those findings? Right. In our study, we also investigated the number of people who were diagnosed with a second melanoma and their relative and disease-specific survivals. So of patients with primary melanoma in situ, 4.3% experience a second primary invasive melanoma, and 7.4% experienced a second primary melanoma in situ. Now, what was remarkable is the relative survival for both of these groups were still above 100%. And in fact, they were higher than the relative survival for patients who were diagnosed with a first and only melanoma in situ. So if patients who were diagnosed with a second primary invasive melanoma had a 15-year relative survival of 116%. Patients who were diagnosed with a second melanoma in situ had a relative survival of 126%. This sort of points to the dose-dependent nature of, of a melanoma diagnosis and how having multiple diagnoses may actually mean that there is something about these patients who are diagnosed with melanoma other than the melanoma diagnosis itself that is contributing to their overall relative survival. Do you have any thoughts about what these other factors might be that aren't captured in the CR database that you use for the study that might explain these differences in relative survival? 
I think a lot of it comes down to screening. And skin cancer screening is really good at picking up cancers that are either slow growing or indolent. And so patients that get diagnosed with melanoma in situ, just by the basic standard of care that we conduct in the United States, those patients often are deemed at higher risk. And they are. And this data does show that uh, disease-specific survival for these patients is lower over time. But these patients end up getting screened for melanoma every single year and sometimes multiple times a year. And when you do that, you have a higher chance of finding more melanoma in situ or more lesions that are really thin and indolent and perhaps never would have progressed to shorten someone's life or increase morbidity in their life. And so what this data is actually showing is that these folks that end up coming to be screened more often and then, you know, invariably get a diagnosis of a second melanoma, there's something different considering their uh, health-seeking behavior that translates to other aspects of their health. Maybe they exercise more. Perhaps their diet is different. Um, We can postulate a lot of different things. But the figures in this paper really do tell a story. And then the other thing I would say is these relative survival figures that are shown in this study have been shown for other cancers in which overdiagnosis has been an issue, like breast cancer. If you look at the relative survival of patients with DCIS, there too it is actually above 100% as well. So I think something is similar going on between uh, these two cancers. Yeah, I think this work raises a lot of interesting questions about how can we differentiate more indolent forms of melanoma in situ from those that we're more concerned are going to progress to more invasive disease or more serious disease. And I think it also raises a lot of questions about how best to screen individuals in the population as well as those who've had a prior diagnosis of melanoma in situ. What do you think is next in terms of research on this topic to help us move the field forward? So one other aspect of this research that we did was trying to find out among the patients that were diagnosed with melanoma in situ and ended up having a bad outcome, say death, what were the characteristics of those patients? And perhaps we could come up with some kind of you know, algorithm or some other way of identifying who among the patients with melanoma in situ are perhaps those at a higher risk of death. And what we found is that older patients, i.e. patients over 80 years old, are at higher risk of having a bad outcome. Patients that are with acrolentigous melanoma histology are also at higher risk as well. And so perhaps if we, you know, find a way to find clinical factors that are easily measurable, or maybe even genetic factors, that's, you know, a potential avenue as well, to identify which melanoma in situ are destined to progress versus which ones are not, we can have a better understanding of who to screen and who not to screen. And in fact, The decision to screen somebody with melanoma in situ in the United States is a lot different than it is in other countries. There are some places in Europe where the receipt of a diagnosis of melanoma in situ actually does not then mean that you should be screened more often afterwards. The recommendations being you should only screen those patients that receive a diagnosis of invasive melanoma in subsequent care. And so you just kind of let patients that have been diagnosed with melanoma in situ go and just come back when or if they have symptomatic disease. So I think our work does have some implications as it relates to uh, different screening strategies for people with melanoma in situ. You know, do we need to see them, you know, every three to six months for the first, you know, five years and then annually for the rest of their life? I'm not sure that's necessarily uh, the case. And I think it should be something that should be studied. Yeah, it sounds like there's plenty of questions that keep you busy for quite some time to come. 
Any final thoughts for our listeners, Dr. Adamson or Mr. Patel? I have one final thought, and it's what the receipt of the diagnosis of melanoma in situ actually does to a person. Yes, it is a diagnosis that has great survival statistics, but it also is a label of cancer. And we can't downplay how that can affect how somebody sees themselves in the world thinks about fears of cancer recurrence, thinks about whether they can have access to you know, life insurance. And I think that we really need to think hard about how this affects patients you know, personally, because right now this is a diagnosis that is increasing every single year. So I think we need to take great care in understanding how we can you know, help those patients deal with the diagnosis beyond just uh, treating them and screening them, but also educating them as to what it really means for their overall health receiving this diagnosis. Yeah, I think that's some really important implications of this kind of work. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Adamson and Mr. Patel, for this really interesting and insightful discussion. This is Dr. John Barbieri, Associate Editor for JAMA Dermatology. You can find a link to the paper in this episode's description. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the JAMA Dermatology Podcast. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. Thanks for listening.